My brother-in-law died suddenly, and now my sister and her kids have to sell their home. That's why I told my husband we could not put off getting life insurance any longer. An agent offered us a 10-year, $500,000 policy for nearly $50 a month. Then we called SelectQuote. SelectQuote found us identical coverage for only $19 a month, a savings of $369 a year. Whether you need a $500,000 policy or a $5 million policy, Select Quote could save you more than 50% on term life insurance. For your free quote, go to SelectQuote.com. SelectQuote.com. That's SelectQuote.com. Select Quote. We shop, you save. Full details on example policies at SelectQuote.com slash commercials. My brother-in-law died suddenly, and now my sister and her kids have to sell their home. That's why I told my husband we could not put off getting life insurance any longer. An agent offered us a 10-year, $500,000 policy for nearly $50 a month. Then we called SelectQuote. SelectQuote found us identical coverage for only $19 a month, a savings of $369 a year. Whether you need a $500,000 policy or a $5 million policy, Select Quote could save you more than 50% on term life insurance. For your free quote, go to SelectQuote.com. SelectQuote.com. That's SelectQuote.com. Select Quote. We shop, you save. Full details on example policies at SelectQuote.com slash commercials. What's going on, everybody? It's Sunday night, about 11 o'clock, and Fruit Loop showed up, and we were ready to do that second episode for you guys, but we had some technical difficulties with her computer updating, and then when it updated, there's a problem with um, our audio feed on her computer, so um, she had to leave to go somewhere, and so what we may do this summer, um, our schedules are just so crazy. And we don't want to wait too long before we put out new content. There may be times it's just me. There may be times it's just her. And then there will always be times where it's just us. But just to keep this thing rolling, um, here I am by myself. And it feels weird. But let's do it. So last week, there were some things that were put out in the Aiden Fucci case, which was a list of the state's discovery that they intend to bring into court. Um, some of these things are audio recordings with Aiden, his mother, and his father. Now, remember, his mother is now facing charges of tampering with, with evidence, I believe is the charge. If you remember, uh, oddly enough, they have surveillance cameras in their home, and she was caught on camera trying to wash blood off of his jeans and then putting them back into his room, which later, when they had the search warrant, they found wet jeans. So uh, she was arrested. She got out on bond really quickly after that. But she's embedded in this, definitely. They're also going to use downloaded contents of cell phones for Aiden's mother and his father. Uh, They're going to bring in shoes and T-shirts collected from Aiden Fucci's room. And the results from phone subpoenas for Aiden, Jason Fucci, as well as a person identified as TB, which I kind of think maybe is a minor Uh, Just given their ages and the fact that he had made comments to friends um, at some point that he fantasized about taking somebody in the woods and murdering them. Um, So there's going to be a lot of minors, I'm sure, testifying in this. The witness list was probably one of the longest witness lists I've ever seen. Uh, I think there was over 200 people that had gotten subpoenas. So they're also going to use five video files and two JPEG files from Snapchat. And if you guys remember, when they had detained Aiden to take him to be questioned, he posted that Snapchat where he's throwing up a peace sign, and it says, has anybody seen Tristan lately? And I have to say, when I saw that post about him, it, it kind of blew my mind just at, at how bold that was. I believe he even had made some comments online that were foul in nature about her being missing. So they have surveillance videos from Aiden's residence, which obviously is going to include hiding that evidence. And they also have included neighborhood videos from five different locations. I got to see one snippet uh, this week of a video, um, surveillance video that shows Aiden and Tristan walking. I don't think it's been released yet. It was sent to me. Uh, You can't see any details. They're kind of whited out. Uh, and then you see somebody walking a dog in the background. So I'm, I wonder if they tried to track him down as a witness because this was right before um, she was murdered. They were walking down the street after leaving that rec center. 
So he initially had a court date scheduled for July 26 to do a pretrial, but um, just this past week they waived his right to a speedy trial, and so they've reset that date for September 29th, 2021. We'll see if it goes off then. Um, I, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of mental evaluations for him, a lot of, uh, I would say, adolescent psychiatrics are going to come in and, and evaluate him too and talk about how the brain doesn't develop till what, men are 24 but I, I think when you have a hundred and something stab wounds, um, he knew what he was doing. And, um, yeah. Remember, he was initially charged with second degree murder, but due to the number of stab wounds, they upgraded that to first degree murder because the way of thinking is every time that, that knife was raised to stab her, that's premeditation knowing that coming down with the knife and injuring her could cause her death. So he got first-degree murder, charged as an adult, but as far as we know, he's being held in a juvenile detention facility. So this was very profound for me, um, just with a nonchalant attitude. When Aiden was told in the interrogation room by his parents that her body had been found, um, Aiden's response was, how is that my problem? And, um, oh, it's his problem. All right. Later on in the interrogation, Aiden said he tried to, k to kiss Tristan. And he was rejected. And he said that her reaction to him trying to kiss her was that she grabbed him. And so according to him, he pushed her down and he says she hit her head and he told her to F off and he left. So it doesn't explain how his knife was found in the retention pond, the blade stuck in her head. Um, it's also this, this one shocked me to my core, maybe because I, I have a 14 year old and a 15 year old and it's just to know that that kids these ages can do a crime like this you, you just it makes the world a lot scarier for mom knowing that there are Aiden Fucci's walking around out there it's just terrifying so during a search warrant at the house the investigators found a notebook that belonged to Aiden and inside they found drawings that were really violent in nature um, they said they were very disturbing and had satanic themes, which included pentagrams and these violent drawings of women, which I think is very telling, um, his mindset about women. It said that one drawing had a woman with red X's over the breast and genital area, and then the arms had drawings with blood coming out of them. This one surprised me. The medical examiner said he did not find any evidence of sexual assault. One thing that was found on her body, though, was a smiley face drawn on her ankle with the word karma written in blue ink. Now, they haven't said if they believe Aiden did that or if Tristan did that. Um, they haven't released that. Just I would be interested to see who did. Um, she was found lying in a wooded area on her right side. And on her possession, she had a gold ring, a cell phone, a $20 bill, and a cotton candy vape. She also had a fortune cookie paper, and that was in her cell phone case. So the sheriff's office said all of the items were covered in blood, as you can imagine with that many stab wounds. So let's look at what the uh, medical examiner uh, notes say about what they found. It says that Tristan's bra was worn inside out. She was wearing uh, black Nike brand sweatpants and black and white slip-on van shoes. She was coming out of rigor mortis and appeared to have skin slippage. So with rigor mortis, you get it so long after death, and then your body relaxes again. And apparently with that, they can estimate a time of death because those are coming stages, and they're able to say, well, rigor mortis is this many hours, and then the body relaxes as if you, know, you can move it very easily to where rigor mortis, the body's stiff. Um, she had skin slippage. And based on those findings, the medical examiner estimated her time of death with uh, being done around 1.45 a.m. to 3.30 in the morning on May 10th, 2021, which, as we know, was Mother's Day. I uh, cannot imagine um, what that poor mama was going through. Good grief. They also said that Tristan appeared to have handprints on her upper left, inner, and outer thighs inner left calf, inner right calf, upper right thigh, and the handprint on her upper left thigh appear consistent with a right hand. And based on the pattern of the ridges, it was determined it would not have been her own hand. So 
I guess the assumption is Aiden's. And they say there was no sexual assault, but um, I wonder if it was fought for. Now, Tristan was very athletic. If you remember, she was a cheerleader. She was in very good physical shape, and um, she definitely fought for her life. So if something like that were happening, I, I, I would think that she was able to fight him off. I, I don't think they found any injuries on him or they haven't released that they have. I would be interested to know that. Um, she was found to have um, a total of 114 stab or cutting wounds concentrated to the top of her head, the back of her neck, the back of both her arms and hands, and her back. Some of the injuries to her hands were penetrating, which indicated the time at the time of those injuries her hands were on a hard object, and they say it's most likely her head, so in a defensive position, as you can imagine, where you're covering your head trying to protect yourself. And based on the nature of the injuries, it appeared the suspect was standing behind Tristan and coming at a downward angle. So it's all really sad, sad stuff to read. It's gross. It's, it's morbid. And this poor girl uh, suffered so much before uh, her body gave in to this violence and she passed. So we're going to jump into uh, the Murdoch case really quickly. There's a legal battle going on here in South Carolina, SLED, which is the state law enforcement division. They were in court on Wednesday of last week, and they've, they've had a lawsuit filed on them by the Post and Courier, which is in Charleston. That's a Charleston-based newspaper. And the Post and, C and Courier has accused them of violating state public record, the State Public Records Act by not releasing the police reports on the murders when they did. And when they did, it was mostly redacted. If you guys remember, and we posted these documents, uh, there was very little that was visible. It was all redacted out. So investigators are saying, hey, look, the reason we don't want to release anything right now is because we don't know what evidence is crucial to solving the case. Here's my thing. There's two things that, well, one thing that came out last week is that they're investigating some kind of a forced entry. They don't say where on the property or anything. But if you if you couple that with the fact that the next day they said there was no threat to the public, it tells me just as kind of an online sleuther and true crime follower or podcaster or whatever, um, that maybe they know who did it and they know why. Because when you have a prominent family murdered and in a violent way and you say there's no threat to the public as soon as the sun rises pretty much, uh, I think you know who you're dealing with. Uh, I think they know what's up. So a lawyer for the state of South Carolina, or for the, for the newspaper, they seem to indicate the investigation is not looking at a particular person or theory or the events leading up to the killing. So they argue if the wrong details are made public, it could affect witness memory or make it hard for detectives to catch people in lies who are being questioned. And, at this, and, and there was a statement put out by um, SLED and the, the Colleton County Sheriff's Office together. They said, at this stage of any investigation such as this, it is exceedingly difficult to know precisely what evidence, witnesses, and information are of ultimate importance and what evidence, witnesses, or information proves to be of little value. Uh, and then the attorney for the newspaper comes back and says they're not thinking about the Freedom of Information Act. They're just redacting as they see fit. And, yeah, I think that's what's going on here. <laughs> Seems pretty obvious. So what's going to happen is um, I believe this week a judge is going to review those redactions and see if it's warranted. And if some of those things are not warranted, we should see another release with some more information and there's so much speculation online right now as to what happened and who did it and why. So sometimes these little clues that they trickle out can give you a, a little bit of a direction to go in to see where the investigation is. I still think it's an inside thing. It's just they're not acting like anybody else outside of the Murdoch family is in danger. So, um, yeah, and the forced entry. I have that here again. Um, just... Yeah, forced entry. So who knows? So what they did uh, and what the law enforcement division did in response to this lawsuit is they released their redaction logs and they listed reasons why each section was redacted. So we're going to run through these really quick. And then the last thing we're going to do is read a, an email from Charles Vallow to Lori during the time that she disappeared 
for a bunch of days, leaving JJ with um, with Charles in Texas. But let's do this redaction log. Page two, it says the redacted information provides details about the manner in which the crime was committed. They say the release could impede the investigation and be misconstrued by the public. Page three, the redacted information provides details about the vehicles found at the crime scene as well as who found the victims. On page four, they redacted information that provides details about evidence seized from the crime scene as well as which individuals were present at the incident location. So I'm wondering if they're talking about family members or law enforcement. If it's law enforcement, you would think that uh, they might not put that out. But we already know Alex called 911. He found the body. So I'm curious to see who else uh, is included in that. On page 8, the redacted information provides details about the location of a body at the crime scene. Um, page 12 also, same thing. It, it provides details about the location of a body. So on pages 9, 10, 11, 16, and 17, the redacted information provides details about the canvas performed by law enforcement, which contains information about which homes have video cameras. So my thought is, okay, but you could release that stuff and then just redact the homes, um, you know, whether or not they were able to get surveillance that was relevant to this investigation. Um, page 13 it says, uh, or I'm sorry, page 14. 14 and 15, the redacted information provides details about the vehicles found at the crime scene, the manner of injury to the victims, and the firearms seized. On page 17, it says the redacted information provides details about the canvas performed by law enforcement, which contains information about which, home, which homes have video cameras. So again, and Fitz News put out a really great video that shows all of the surveillance from the night of the boat crash. So I watched it and, and it's interesting to see. Um, you can definitely see Buster acting a fool uh, at the bar. So what it shows is uh, it starts with Paul going in to buy the liquor or the alcohol. And you see the lady check the ID and then he walks out. And as he gets to the gas pump where he's filling up his car, he kind of lifts the beer with both hands above his head, almost like, hey, I got it. Because, you know, adults don't do that. <laughs> you go to your car and put it in your car. You'll make a whole whole thing out of it. Um, and then they also show um, Paul and I, I want to say it wasn't Connor. Uh, he's with another person on the boat, I think Alexander. And it shows them drinking at that uh, bar in downtown Beaufort. You see Paul kind of lean over the, um, the bar a little bit. And then when they're leaving, they kind of meet up with everybody else. That They were the only two that went in. The other group, it looks like, went to some swings that were just, you could see off camera, but not great. And so when they were done drinking, they meet back up with them. And there looks to be a little bit of drama between Paul and his girlfriend, uh, who I think is his girlfriend. And then you kind of see just a little bit of a disagreement, nothing hostile or anything that looks like there's going to be a fight, just arguing when drunk people argue, it's just, you know, they point their face a little further and obviously yell a little harder. Um, and then you see them get into the boat and leave, and that is right before the accident happens. I haven't been able to zoom in and kind of clear it up a little bit. I do want to see if Paul was the one driving that boat. So, But this week, we're hoping that maybe they will go ahead and release some of this redacted stuff to give us a little more insight into what's going on with that investigation. So the last thing that we wanted to catch up on is Justin Lum just released this email that was sent from Charles to Lori back when Lori disappeared for a bunch of days. If you remember, she left JJ in Texas with Charles, and they didn't hear anything from her at all. So I'm going to read through this email. It's uh, about a page and a half, and then we'll be done. So it says, Lori, the purpose of this email is, again, try and establish a family connection with you and our son. Also, clarify the facts as I've seen them, regardless of where you want to go with a divorce. It's been 38 days since you made any contact with us. 38 days. That's crazy. So your mom, you know, your mom to an autistic boy, and you just leave him for 38 days, which is not good for him. Um, so it goes on to say, this is necessary because when I saw Alex this past Saturday, he made me aware that I somehow 
had taken JJ and tried to put you in jail. What Alex said was confusing. I really, fur- I was really further confused that the entire family had refused contact, not just with me, but also JJ. And I had not heard that, um, that they wouldn't talk to JJ during that dry spell where she was gone. And I think we can take Adam and Zach out of this equation. We know they definitely were advocates for Charles and JJ. But it, he's saying here the rest of the Cox family just, you know, radio silence for that poor kid. It says, Lori, on January 30th, I received a call from you stating that we were done and all my stuff was gone from the house. I flew back to Phoenix and find that my truck, along with my wallet and keys, had been taken from the airport. I also saw that $35,000 was taken from the business account by you. 22000 of that was to be paid the next day to other reps. I called the police to file a vehicle theft report. While explaining the circumstances, the police officer also suggested I stop and talk, talk to a place called Bridges about your involvement. They are the ones that ordered the psych eval. Once home in Gilbert, once home, the Gilbert police helped me break into our own home. When I got in and discovered everyone gone. Also, JJ's clothes, JJ's favorite iPad, my clothes, work computer, and even Bailey's training collar were gone also. For those of you new to the case, Charles got JJ a service dog, um, I I think this dog really was successful in helping JJ to sleep through the night, which is a a common problem with kids with autism. Um, The the training collar was gone. I mean, that's that's just personal. So the next morning, I got a rental car and went to JJ's school. When you entered the gates with JJ, I did go to your car and retrieved your purse. You obviously had a spare set of keys and left. I texted you and asked you to return my things, and I would give you back your purse. You responded by telling me where my truck and clothes could be found. You also asked me to drop off your purse with Angela when I picked up JJ from school that day, which I did. I assume Angela must work at that school. I have to look and see if she's on the witness list at any point. On the same day, Kay received a text from you. She didn't tell me about it until Friday, with February 1st, obviously I'm thinking 2019. I was shocked beyond belief when I read it. In case you don't recall, here it is. That text is redacted, but it seems like she was making accusations of Charles having an affair because Charles goes on to say, Lori, if if it somehow makes you feel better to make these kind of accusations, then I certainly can't stop you. But for the record, you and I both, and he put both in caps, know it's ridiculous. You are my one and only for 14 years, period. Ah, it's so sad. I mean, even with all the chaos she's caused, he's still... You're my one and only. Um, only after hearing this from Alex did I begin to put the pieces together. Lori, you are the only one whose response I will accept to the following offer. On Friday, March 15th, I will have all my stuff vacated from the house. You may have it back on Saturday, March 16th. I will continue to pay all the bills, and you and I can work out a schedule with JJ. I will also schedule a locksmith to come change all the locks for you. So again, he's going to... Give her a home, pay the bills. He's going to coordinate a time with her where he could see his son, and he's going to have a locksmith change the locks on his house for her so he can't get in. Uh, There was nothing. I I, I think he could have told her that he's got her a $5 million mansion, and I think at that point she was just gone. Um, If you you have not contacted me, the only conclusion – I can draw is that after 38 days, you and your family no longer want communication with JJ. This will be your choice, and it was an all bold, your. I'm going to take action and continue to take care of JJ because I'm not getting any response from you. I have no other choice. You've taken away all his family here. It makes us both really sad, and I really hurt for him. You're his mother. He misses you. Please agree to see your son, Charles. And that was just so hard to read. I mean, he's being very civil in spite of the fact that she's taken his stuff, hidden his truck, you know, moved all of his stuff out. He's still saying, hey, let's just get a co-parenting plan going. Let me give you a house to live in. Let, let me see my son. And we know at that point that was not in her plans. But it goes to show you, Charles went to law enforcement several times on body cam we see him pleading and not in a make fun of her because she's a wackadoodle way 
but out of love. And none of it was ever good enough for her. So again, tomorrow we are hoping to get all of these documents uh, sent our way. We're going to dive right in, see what we find, get it out to you. As soon as we come across stuff, we know you'll want to see. Um, what was that? Oh, that had something else to say. Yeah, so in the future, it's just going to be a mixed bag. It's going to be uh, Fruit Loop by herself sometimes, me by myself, and then we'll always have the dynamic duo sitting here together. Uh, things change. She's living a little bit further away right now um, than she was. So it's just very difficult, and we're just going to adjust and make it work and uh, keep pumping out the content for you guys because we love y'all. We have the best listeners in the world. So that's all for now. Uh, we'll keep our eye out for any breaking news, and I will definitely keep you updated when I get the Valo dump tomorrow. All right, you guys have a good night. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.